Dr. Yong Mi Kim is joined the Dr. Department Yong of Kim. Asian Studies at the University of Edinburgh as a senior lecturer in Korean studies in August 2017. And prior of this, Dr. Yong Mi Kim was an asso associated professor of international relations and public policy at Central European U University Budapest. And now I would like to hand over the microphone to Dr. Yong Mi Kim. Please, Dr. Yong Mi Kim. Thank you for your introduction. Um, let me introduce Professor Yong Ho Kim, who will give a welcome remark. Um, Professor Yong Ho Kim is currently serving as a president of Yumbo Sun Institute for Democracy since 2021, also working as the editor in chief of Asian Brief, online weekly issue published by Asia Center at Seoul National University. Please welcome President Yong Ho Kim. United Kingdom, I must say that good morning everyone in UK and uh, good evening everyone in South Korea. It is my great honor to present my welcoming remarks at Yunbosun Memorial Symposium co-organized by the University of Edinburgh and Yunbosun Institute for Democracy. On behalf of my institute, first of all, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to all the participants, including Dr. Mathison, Ambassador Smith, Professor Youngmi Kim, Ambassador Taesik Lee, Ambassador Geun Kim, Mr. Sangu Yoon, and uh, Professor Young Jo. As you know, eight years ago, we started this symposium in honor of Republic of Korea's former president, Yun Bo Sun, who studied anthropology at University of Edinburgh from 1924 to 1930. It is no wonder that his experience of British democracy during his stay in Edinburgh became the basic guideline of his lifelong political activities pursuing democracy and political freedoms under authoritarian government in South Korea. In this regard, I appreciate the University of Edinburgh, which provided him with uh, the foundation of his strong belief in democracy and political freedom. Thanks to democracy movement led by Yun bo and other political leaders, South Korea finally introduced the democratic political system in 1987. Over the past uh, three decades, South Korea has successfully implemented democratic politics. However, South Korean democracy is not perfect and uh, still fragile. So my institute is trying to find out the way of consolidating and deepening South Korea's democracy. In addition to honoring the former president Yun bo Sun, this symposium intends to extend the exchange of views held by scholars and uh, experts of the two countries on a variety of issues, including domestic and international politics, economy, social life, culture, and uh, science and uh, technology. This year, 
we selected the, the new agenda for South Korea UK cooperation in the COVID 19 era as the main topic of this symposium. As you know, the COVID 19 pandemic has been significantly changing people's daily life in the world. Under this situation, today and tomorrow, we are talking about some issues related to new political economy, international development cooperation, and US-China strategic competition in the, the COVID-19 era. I hope this symposium will contribute to facilitate the strenuous efforts of South Korea and the UK governments, which are trying to bring our daily life back to normal. It is my desire that this symposium is also contributing to the promotion of bilateral cooperation between South Korea and the United Kingdom, which are confronting similar challenges in the COVID-19 era. Lastly, but not the least, I would like to emphasize that this symposium is one way of helping University of Edinburgh advance Korean studies program. As you know, University of Edinburgh created the Korean studies program and recruited Professor Youngmi Kim as a senior lecturer for the program in 2017. I am very delighted to see that the university's Korean studies program is slowly developing. For example, in early September this year, more than 100 early career researchers and uh, graduate students who came from not only the UK, but also many countries in the world participated in the big conference on East Asia. Under the leadership of Professor Youngmi Kim, I hope my institute will continue to help University of Edinburgh develop the Korean studies program. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude to the staffs who have diligently prepared for this program in the hybrid form of online and offline. I hope you enjoy this symposium very much. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you for the welcome remarks, Professor Kim. And next, Professor Peter Madison, Principal and Vice Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh will give an opening remark. Professor Peter Madison took over the office of Principal and Vice Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh in February, 2018. He was formerly the 15th President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong. Please welcome Principal and Vice Chancellor Peter Madison. Thank you, uh, Young Mi, and uh, good morning from Edinburgh and good evening to uh, South Korea. So we're um, sorry that we're not meeting physically either in Edinburgh or in uh, Seoul. It's very difficult to find hotel rooms in Scotland at the moment because of COP26 uh, <laughs> taking place just 44 miles from where I'm standing. So um, we uh, um, maybe chose a good moment to have a hybrid conference. Uh, but we're very pleased to see our friends and colleagues from uh, from Korea and uh, and to continue this excellent relationship that we have between our 
universities uh, and, our, and our people and our countries. Um, so, uh, Professor Kim, Excellencies and Ambassadors, colleagues, friends, um, uh, just a few words of welcome uh, from me. Um, we're very proud at the University of Edinburgh of our alumni. Um, uh, we are an old university. We've been around for 430 odd years and uh, we uh, have many uh, alumni around the world, but few have been as successful or as distinguished in their career as, as young Po Sun. So the idea that we uh, were the educational alma mater of somebody that became a head of state and influenced democracy in the ways that he did is something that we gives us a lot of pride. And so uh, of the many reasons why I'm interested to support this institute and this partnership uh, is to pay respects to one of our very distinguished alumni. And you will also be aware that uh, in 2019, soon after I arrived here, um, we honored uh, Yun Sanku, um, a son of Yun Po Sun, uh, with an honorary degree. So we've continued our connections with the, with the family. Um, the topics that have been chosen for today's symposium are enormous and significant. And I just wanted to make a couple of remarks about the extent to which universities like the University of Edinburgh uh, and indeed uh, the fine universities in South Korea are influenced by external events. It, I've often said in my last few years, particularly when I worked in Hong Kong, but also when I worked uh, here in Edinburgh, that life would be simpler for universities if we didn't have to be affected by external events, by political shifts, by international relationships and their ups and downs, uh, and in the recent history by a pandemic. But of course, if we want to be socially significant and economically significant organizations, we have to be responsive to these events. We have to lead the debate. We have to be the places where the discussions take place about how we should react to such events. And the pandemic is a very good example. Universities all around the world, including in Scotland and in Korea, have uh, led the scientific response to the pandemic. We've had our scientists studying the virus itself. We've come up with drug treatments and vaccines and diagnostic tests. And we've also had uh, academics studying the social and economic and political consequences of COVID. And I think there will be textbooks and PhD theses written for years to come on the ways in which universities and uh, academics contributed to the management of the pandemic and the extent to which evidence and policy were linked. And this is an interesting topic for me because my background is in medicine and although, although I am not an expert on viruses or on public health, I've followed this intersection between scientific advice and the development of policy with great interest. I think it's been a very interesting period for the linkage between universities and society and politicians. So to pick these three topics, the relationships between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Korea in the period after Brexit, uh, then the new political economy in the aftermath of COVID-19 and the ways in which COVID-19 has affected all of our lives, and thirdly, the massive topic of United States-China uh, competitions and the relationships between the United States in the uh, period uh, since uh, the switch between President Trump and President Biden. Uh, President Biden is in Scotland this morning. Um, I saw pictures on the television news this morning of his uh, cars uh, moving between Edinburgh, where he's staying, and Glasgow, where the conference is. Uh, so we have a lot of very significant people in Edinburgh at the moment because of COP26. Uh, so this is a good time for the symposium to be thinking about these massive issues that we wish to influence, we wish to understand, and we wish to uh, maximize the impact of our partnership to try and contribute to uh, the, the way forward in the face of these external challenges. Um, I had the pleasure of hosting uh, Ambassador uh, Gun Kim uh, in Edinburgh uh, very recently uh, with uh, Young Me. Um, uh, and uh, I was pleased that Ambassador Kim made one of his first uh, visits uh, around the UK 
uh, after he's arrived here and after he's uh, able to travel because of COVID. Um, uh, one of his first visits was to Edinburgh and I was very pleased to meet him and to host him here. And I think, again, this is another example of the strength of the partnership between the University of Edinburgh uh, and the Republic of South Korea. So, so um, thank you very much for all the organizers of today's symposium. I know uh, Young Me has done a lot of work uh, on the Edinburgh side and uh, colleagues here. Uh, and I know that there'll be many people in Seoul uh, that, that have also uh, worked very hard to put this symposium together. I wish you every success and I hope that we'll be able to meet physically again before too long. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we can work across the miles and across the time zones. We can effectively collaborate. We have well-formed relationships and good understanding of the different parties. And so I think this is the basis for a very successful continuing collaboration. And uh, with that, Young Me, I wish everybody a very enjoyable uh, um, symposium. Uh, and I hope that some new friendships and some new knowledge will emerge in the next couple of days and we will continue the success of this relationship. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to just to welcome people. I'd prefer to be doing it uh, in person, but uh, online has to be the way for the moment for us. Uh, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you for the um, opening remark, Professor Peter Matheson. And next, Mr. Simon Smith, UK Ambassador to the Republic of Korea will give a congratulatory remark. Ambassador Smith, Simon Smith is a British diplomat currently serving as Britain's um, ambassador to the Republic of Korea. Mr. Smith attended Wadham College, Oxford to study German and French, gaining BA in modern languages in 1990s, sorry, 1980s. Please welcome Ambassador Simon Smith. Thank you very much, President Kim Yong-ho, Principal and Vice-Chancellor Peter Matheson, my dear friends, Dr. Yun Sang-gu and Ambassador Kim Gunn, my esteemed colleague, Ambassador Ite Shik, distinguished participants, everybody, good evening, good morning. It's a great pleasure for me to offer my congratulations on the opening of the 2021 Yun Poson Memorial Symposium. Our themes this year focus closely on cooperation between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Korea. And I'm really pleased to note that 2021 has been a very special year for that cooperative relationship. In the British Embassy, we are as good as certain that this is the first year ever in which the President of the Republic of Korea has paid two separate visits to the United Kingdom. In June this year, we were thrilled to have the opportunity as the presidency of the G7 to invite President Moon Jae-in as one of the special guests to the G7 summit in Cornwall. And it's been a year in which South Korean representatives have participated in many of the strands of the G7 process and many of those at ministerial level. And right now, President Moon uh, is, as I speak, in Scotland. Uh, and his personal attendance at COP26 in Glasgow comes at the end of a year in which there's been an especially close partnership between the UK and Korea on our approaches to climate change. There's been a broad range of dialogue between decision makers from government, from civil society, business and finance, from both countries, as we've together looked ahead at how we tackle the challenge of comprehensive energy transition, the challenge we have to take on in order to ensure that we stop the progress of global heating and that we steer away from a climate disaster. And we've looked and learned together at how we embrace the huge opportunities that this change will offer us to develop our economies in the ways that will bring us sustainable success and prosperity in the future. And I've personally been engaged intensively on this agenda with legislators, with ministers, with business and community leaders in Seoul and all over the country. 
as we've shared our perspectives on the policies and the technologies that we'll need in order to achieve the goal that we share of a carbon neutral economy by the year 2050. Now looking back at the G7 summit, this was the occasion for the leaders of all 11 countries participating to put on record their strong shared commitment to open societies, democratic values and multilateralism, to open markets, to fair competition and the rule of law. Now this overarching statement from the G7 summit, uh, which was uh, unanimously adopted and included obviously the, uh, the, uh, the uh, agreement of the, the four nations invited as guests to the summit, this statement with its explicit commitment to working together to create an open and inclusive rules-based international order for the future, I'm sure this will remain a very valuable guiding text for the UK and South Korea as we deepen cooperation even further in tackling the challenges of the 21st century. But this has also been a year in which we've looked together at security challenges, a year in which despite serious logistical obstacles, we were able two months ago to take a considerable number of Korean decision makers out to sea some 60 miles offshore to visit Britain's newest aircraft carrier, HMS Queen Elizabeth. And this visit left me further convinced that cooperation between our armed forces and our defense industries is another fruitful area in which the UK and the Republic of Korea can go forward together. Now this year's Yunpasun Memorial Symposium puts a well-chosen focus on three areas in which I'm sure Britain and Korea will have a great deal to say to each other and I hope that those who lead and participate in the discussions will identify yet more opportunities that Britain and Korea can explore together. Thank you very much. Thanks for the congratulatory remark, Your Excellency, Mr. Smith. Mm, next, Mr. Kun Kim, UK Ambassador of the Republic of Korea, will give a congr congratulatory remark. Mr. Kim was appointed as the Ambassador of the Republic of Korea in July 2021. Ambassador Kun Kim will deliver a congratulatory remark in a video, unfortunately. Uh, please watch the video. Principal and Vice Chancellor Peter Mattison, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to join you today for the 2021 Yumboson Memorial Symposium. I wish to express my sincere gratitude to all participants who are joining online. I am confident that you will give us thoughts to further strengthen Korea-UK relations. And I wish to thank the University of Edinburgh for kindly hosting this event. I also thank the Yoon Boson Memorial Association in Korea for their unwavering efforts in promoting the former president's legacy. Last month, I visited the University of Edinburgh and gave a lecture on Korea and the UK. Over 100 students participated in the lecture and raised sharp, incisive questions throughout the session. Their questions were not only confined to relations between our two countries, they were also extended to global issues such as Quad, China, Japan, and the Indo-Pacific. I was deeply impressed that these young scholars and students were so interested in Korea and its view on global issues. Let me briefly touch on the past and current status of Korea-UK relations. The UK has been a long-standing friend of Korea. Our diplomatic relations date back to 1883. Since that time, our two countries have developed a close partnership. And as you are well aware, British soldiers fought alongside us during the Korean War in the 1950s to defend our freedom for which we, the Korean people, are still tremendously grateful. We have come a long way since then, 
And in recent years, we have become closest than ever as we share our core values of democracy, market economy, and human rights. We have also seen remarkable growth in investment in recent years. I have high hopes that our economic cooperation will grow even further as we are well prepared for the post-Brexit era, thanks to the ROK UK FTA. Cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges have also witnessed a phenomenal boom. Koreans love dramas and music from the UK, such as The Crown and Coldplay. K-drama and K-pop exemplified by Squid Game and BTS are also loved by the British people. Recently, Coldplay and BTS collaborated in a music video titled My Universe. It is beyond merely enjoying one another's culture. Rather, we are collaborating and creating new things together. So it is noted that this is the start point of a new phase of cultural exchanges. This year, we have witnessed remarkable progress in the relationship between the two countries. Last September, Korea and the UK set up a vaccine swap by sharing over 1 million COVID-19 vaccine doses. It enabled Korea to have earliest access to life-saving jabs and contributed to a joint effort to fight against the global pandemic. Furthermore, President Moon Jae-in visited the UK twice this year for summits hosted by the UK government. There were the G7 in Cornwall and COP26 in Glasgow. This further demonstrates our relationship is becoming stronger than ever. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been almost four months since I came here as ambassador. As I manage my daily schedule, I continuously ask myself, in the post-COVID era, what are the areas of cooperation and focus within Korea-UK relations? What challenges will we face and how do we best jointly address those difficulties? In this regard, I find this symposium to be highly timely and relevant, given its title, A New Agenda for South Korea-UK Cooperation in the COVID-19 Era. And I would like to highlight the role of the Yun Bosan Memorial Symposium. It has been making a strong, valuable contribution to the sharing of knowledge between scholars and enhancing mutual understanding between us. It has been making a strong, valuable contribution to the sharing of knowledge between scholars and enhancing mutual understanding between us. It has been broadening its scope with time from primarily focusing on political issues to expanding to cultural and historical as well as social and economic issues. I hope that the rich discussions of these two days will provide us with valuable insights on how to go forward in the post-COVID-19 era. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for congratulatory remarks by ambassadors for, uh, from both countries. I'm Young Mickey again. <laughs> I think our first panel is on a, a new political economy of the COVID-19 um, era. Our first speaker is Professor Young Ho Cho. How are you, Professor Cho? I think we met in uh, Germany a few years ago, right? Very glad to see you again. Um, Professor Cho will talk about COVID-19 and government trust in South Korea. Thank you for inviting me uh, here in this wonderful uh, conference. I'm very pleased to share some of my research to this wonderful audience. Normally, when I write a paper, I am very restricted in terms of drawing implications. But when I present, I, sp I speak more <laughs> than the paper. So I'd like to share some of my view about my paper. Uh, would you like full screen, please? Yes. 
So my paper is about the decline of government trust during the late Moon Jae-in administration through panel data analysis. Using this paper, I wanted to reveal some inner part of Korean politics. This is approval rating of the Moon, uh, Moon Jae-in administration. Moon Jae-in administration started with 84 approval rate during his honeymoon period. And then his approval rating started to decline. And then 2018, his approval rating was 83%, which is pretty high when he met Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un. And then his approval rating uh, declined. And then certainly 2020, especially uh, January and February, the first Chinese uh, woman affected by COVID-19, she came to South Korea and, and COVID-19 started to spread. In early period of the COVID-19, uh, Korean government were, was, was criticized a lot because opposition party, the Kuminehim in Korea, Kuminehim criticized uh, uh, Moon Jae-in administration not to block Chinese people. And then suddenly, uh, the Korean K COVID-19 policy was become su becoming successful. Government approval rating skyrocketed, and then Moon Jae-in government decided to distribute government subsidy, subsidy. And then, <clears throat> 2020, the National Assembly election, legislative election, the ruling party swallowed 180 seats, which was, you know, the big landsliding victory in Korean history. And then certainly, uh, you know, turning to the summer and autumn of 2020, Moon Jae-in government approval rating declined. And then I tried to <coughs> investigate why why Moon Jae-in approval, uh, Jae government approval rating up and down, especially declined slightly, you know, steeply, steeply last year and early this year. <coughs> government trust is always important because government trust is a component of social capital enabling government to solve problems of community. Government solve many problems when citizens have high political trust. However, government face citizen resistance and do just the regular things when citizens are skeptical of their government. Therefore, president must implement their prioritized the policies during their honeymoon period and then they needed to be restricted in response to citizens' political trust. As you saw, Government trust about Moon Jae-in administration is pretty up and down, up and down. Within short period, it you know went down and steeply up. You know this is one part of you know, dynamic Korean politics. I had a motivation for this paper. Since early 2000, Korean politics has been ideologically politicized. Even regionalism has been also politicized. So government performance is not subjectively evaluated among ideological supporters, either progressive or conservatives. However, a large number of citizens tend to evaluate, actually they, they try to actively evaluate government performance in an objective manner. This is why Korean politics is very, very dynamic in some sense instable by showing Koreans hot-tempered disposition. I personally see this cultural trait of Koreans as a source of Korean development, development. Because ideological anchors are not less socially and psychologically embedded into Koreans individual than Western ones. 
For example, as Ite uh, ambassador, Ite 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 Shik Ite Shik mentioned, racism and religion are socially embedded and individually psychologically embedded in the United States. A leftist and rightist ideology are very uh, strong. It, they have very strong social root. However, South Korea does not have, you know, strong religious attachment, ideological, you know, underpinnings. Therefore, Korean people tend to evaluate government performance in a very active way. In the United States, partisanship is, is a stable, they call a moved mover of politics. Partisanship also changes very in Korea in response to government performance. So I had five research questions. For example, how do Korean citizens evaluate government policies? Do they adjust government trust on the basis of their evaluation? What policies affect their trust most? Are they specific or general policies? Normally, uh, trust, political trust scholars argue that it is economic policies or corruptions, but I would say there's a specific policies that affect government trust among Koreans. Especially, I would like to emphasize housing policy in Korea over the last, you know, a couple of years. What implications does it in depth, you know, this in-depth study make? There are competing theories to explain government trust in terms of levels and changes. For example, political partisan models indicate citizens trust their government when they belong to winning or ruling parties and their ideology is close to government. And their second theory of a social and cultural model, middle and upper class citizens are likely to trust the government because they receive more benefit that, than, than those of lower class and marginal classes. So those of high life satisfaction and social trust are likely to trust the government. This is called spillover effect. People who feel, you know, well, they, uh, they look up government and then they show trust. This is speed over effect. And there's a third model of a performance evaluation, which is a theoretical basis of this study. According to this theory, citizens assess government policies and then they decide whether they continue to trust the government or stop. I believe this performance evaluation is is primary in, 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 in the way Koreans see government rather than partisanship or religious attachment or other, you know, other, other factors. So theories are wonderful, however, empirical research of Korea is still short in terms of determining what government policies affect citizens' updating of their political trust because the absence of panel data or the existing research employs cross-national survey at a single time point and they show correlational differences across independent variables rather than causal change. So I <clears throat> wanted to show uh, how government trust change among Korean citizens from summer of 2020 to springtime of 2021. So I, you, actually I, I was a PI of this survey, this panel survey. I and my colleagues surveyed 25, 45 respondents in the summer of 2020. And then I continued to survey 1832 respondents in spring 2020. So I used a regression analysis Dependent variable is government trust. And I <clears throat> chose three independent variables, citizens' evaluation of COVID-19, economic policy, and real estate policy. So first result I would like to uh, present is government trust change. Summer of 2020, from the first survey, 60% of Koreans they stated they support, 
they trust the government. And the 40% shows distrust. And then the second survey, second survey shows 42% stayed, they did not change their trust. And 35% of 40% of, of the first survey, they did not change their, uh, their stance. However, 4% changed from distrust to trust. And 19% changed from trust to distrust. So on average, 14% decline was observed from summer of 2020 and spring of 2021. So even pretty short period, you know, the change is pretty dynamic. And second result, how citizens evaluate three main policies, COVID-19, economy, and real estate, 부동산, housing policy. People positively evaluate corona, corona, corona COVID-19, COVID-19, 70% were positive about COVID-19 in terms of how government handled this issue. And economic issue, this happened, have 46% were negative and 34% positive. But in terms of when it comes to real estate policy, housing policy, 70% of Koreans were very, very negative about government policy. 70% were positive, 13% were neutral. And then I <coughs> wanted to test how this evaluation of three government policies affect government trust the change. And then citizen evaluation of three government policies and trust the change. The corona COVID-19 policy was not that you know, big in this uh, descriptive bar graph. When it comes to economic policy, those who negatively evaluate government policy of economy, they are likely to change from trust to distrust. When it comes to real estate policy, those who negatively evaluate real estate policy, they change their trust from, uh, their, uh, they change their attitude from distrust, uh, trust to distrust. So there's a, a positive relationship between citizens' evaluation of real estate policy and attitude change from trust to distrust. And then I took regression analysis. Here's orange color shows significant variables which means uh, uh, COVID-19 policy and economic policy and real estate policy, they are highlighted by, colored by orange color. They, so, so the, the correlation and coefficient of these three variables shows significant level, significant level. And then ideology, partisanship, affected the change of government trust. What factors affected the most? And result five shows impact of independent variables. According to this, gra uh, this, this graph, real estate policy is the, the biggest impact, biggest factor that, uh, that contributed to negative negative attitude of citizens toward the government. And then uh, from summer of 20, 2020 and spring of 2021, and those supporters other than ruling party, ruling democratic party, they were detached from Moon Jae-in government, Moon Jae-in government. And other social economic factors didn't matter, didn't matter. And I also uh, tested uh, how <coughs> policy evaluation affected government trust. 
government, you know, distrust actually among three generations from young generation and middle middle aged class and middle aged generation and old generations. Uh, among the young generations, economy was the most important factor and middle aged class real estate real estate issue is number one primary issue and then uh, COVID-19 policy was the second biggest issue and all the generation both economic issue and real estate issue affected the government distrust a lot and then I also tested uh, uh, the relationship between policy evaluation and government trust decline among three classes, upper class, middle class, and lower class. It is very interesting that real estate issue didn't matter much among lower class Koreans. However, real estate issue was the biggest issue among upper class Koreans, upper class, upper class Koreans. This graph shows those of lower class, they, it seems that they gave up in terms of buying houses. However, because those of upper class, they have apartment houses, they got angry with Moon Jae in administration's housing policies. So now uh, I come to some conclusions, implications. For example, Korean citizens evaluate government policy to decide whether to update their political trust, which is good for accountability. Especially government trust among citizens tend to fluctuate depending on how government copes with salient issues such as real estate policy, which is pretty you know new issue, new issue. Actually, over the last four years, housing prices was doubled, has been doubled. So young people and those of lower class people, I think they give up. They give up. They, you know, lost their expectation about their, you know, future. They purchase house and they, you know, form family members. I think they gave up. I think. And Korean citizens pay attention to both salient issues, real estate, the COVID-19. This is, you know, uh, direct conclusion from the from the empirical result. And they also, you know, value general issues like economy, economy. So in Korea, how high political interest and active evaluation of government policies make Korean politics dynamic as well as unstable, unstable. When it comes to keynote speech of Yi Tae-sik, Ambassador Yi Tae-sik, he said Korean democracy is also in crisis. However, I think there's a two factors can stop this deconsolidation of Korean democracy. One is Koreans actively evaluate government. The other one is Korean presidential term is only one term, one term. Mm. When it comes to the first uh, you know, issue, Koreans critically evaluate government policies, how it affects Korean politics is like, you know, Korean politics is swing. If I may exaggerate from this result, I would say Korean politics follows pen, pendulum motion by two variables, government performance and partisanship. partisanship. Although partisanship does not have strong, you know, deep root, but when people actively evaluate government, they change their partisanship, their partisanship. Therefore, Korean politics, you know, like follow this movement. So this cultural trait, active evaluation of government performance, sometimes they expect it a lot and they frustrate it a lot. This is a positive and negative side. For example, positive side, it threatens Korean government to work hard and make it accountable. 
On the other hand, it has a negative consequence. For example, it is related to convergence, instability, and improvisational response rather than pluralistic, liberal, tolerant, programmatic development of Korean politics. Uh, this paper has a limitation. For example, this study did not cover narrow number, double standard, and political morality of sexual scandals. For example, Seoul mayor and Busan mayor, they stopped their career because of sexual problem, which are getting serious among elite because the government trusted the object of rational as well as a moral assessment. So now I stop. Thank you.